Live from RT headquarters, I'm in Isanawe. Today, Saudi Arabia beefs up as Yemen descends into chaos. Serbia may seek compensation for NATO's bombing of Belgrade, and a former Lufthansa pilot is in the now. Arabia is on red alert. U.S. officials say heavy military equipment and artillery are being moved to its almost 2,000-kilometer border with Yemen. The kingdom fears worsening chaos could spill onto its territory. Here's why. <laughs> Houthi rebels have seized an air base believed to be the largest military base in the country. U.S. troops have been stationed there since 2012, using it as an intelligence post for hunting al-Qaeda. Also, Yemen's president, Abed Mansour Hadi, reportedly fled, fearing the advance of Shia militants. His administration says it's just rumors. But it's clear Yemen is sinking deeper into political chaos with air raids targeting the presidential palace. This after Houthi rebels announced a $100,000 reward for the arrest of the country's leader. The slipping towards war in Yemen could aggravate Sunni-Shia Sunni tensions. Houthi or Shia rebels now have control of Yemen's capital, with the Sunni president said to have fled the country. Saudi Arabia is concerned more than ever. Joining us in the now is Danny Maki, Middle East researcher, with us on the line from London. Danny, what further action could we see from the neighbor, Saudi Arabia? I mean, Saudi Arabia is now in a state which is, which is very deeply concerning for its borders and for its national national security. They've posted numerous, uh, numerous warnings to the Houthis about their advance on border areas. And recently, they have announced um, a huge uh, ba ba backdrop of military forces on the huge border with Yemen. I mean, Yemen is clearly a country which is significant for Saudi Arabia. I mean, there was the, the whole concept of airstrikes, which was discussed. And the state of Saudi Arabia now is, is at risk, essentially, from these uh, Houthi rebels, which are advancing. And we saw the, the president, um, Mansour Hadi, has left Aden, which has been attacked by Houthi rebels and has fled. So this, uh, Yemen is essentially now in a state of utter chaos and Saudi Arabia as a neighbor with a huge border is very deeply concerned as to what is occurring across the border. There is not much Saudi Arabia can do, however, as it lacks a power base within Yemen and its main ally, we could argue, against the Houthi rebels is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is quite amazing. Uh, in essence, uh, Saudi Arabia has moved this heavy equipment to the border areas and it has raised this, this risk of the Yemen spiraling into further disrepute and more instability for an already unstable region. Yemen's government is pleading for intervention. The Arab League will discuss it on Thursday. Of course, the foreign minister has reportedly said that Egypt and Gulf states have agreed to um, intervene in the country. Cairo, however, denies this. How much could we see this and how fast through the region spread? Well, due to the fact that the main country concerned is Saudi Arabia, intervention could be very quick. Uh, the Arab League would likely sanction any intervention because they're not really allied with the Houthi rebels. Uh, Yemen is now in a state of utter disrepute, so the UN would possibly call, call a meeting, and in the end, Saudi Arabia would get what it wants. But the level of intervention, it, it, it remains hard to, to actually see how this would work out. I mean, there was plans for an observer mission, perhaps, or, or a local ceasefire with the Houthi rebels, but due to the fact that Saudi Arabia borders Yemen, and Yemen is now posing a security threat to Saudi Arabia, the United States is more likely to advocate any sort yeah, of inter in intervention in Yemen, also with the fact that it is fighting al-Qaeda militants within Yemen. Now, the problem is that the al-Qaeda militants that America are fighting are actually fighting the Houthi rebels, who America is unallied to. So we have this geopolitical hall of mirrors where all these different sides are actually fighting each other. I mean, we had in 
late February, uh, the Shiite uh, leader, uh, Abdel Malik Houthi, accused Saudi Arabia of attempting to divide Yemen along sectarian lines. While Saudi Arabia perceives that the Houthis are an existential threat to Saudi security on the border, it is very likely that some sort of intervention will be sanctioned, possibly with Arabic troops. Egypt is not a state which is keen on interventions, as it has a pro-sovereignty policy re in regards to the Arab world. But other actors, such as the United Arab Emirates, the United States and the European Union would all favor and advocate a sort of intervention in Yemen to stop this spiraling, uh, this spiraling conflict, which will pose a new geopolitical war, even possibly bigger and more important to Saudi Arabia than Syria's war or the war in Iraq. Obama has used Yemen as a success story for the U.S.'s war on terror. The strategy of taking out terrorists who threaten us while supporting partners on the front lines is one that we have successfully pursued in Yemen and Somalia for years. Now, Danny, you've mentioned you think the U.S. would back intervention. Does this mean we're seeing a change in their strategy? We have seen Obama take a more isolationist approach to affairs within the Middle East. However, with regards to the Yemen crisis, the sensitivity of the issue and its proximity with Saudi Arabia all indicates that Obama is likely to be in favor of intervention. And the fact that the U.S. has bases within Yemen to attack al-Qaeda militants makes it more likely that Obama would sanction intervention. However, Obama, what he has been contradictory about is we have seen more U.S. airstrikes in Yemen, and drone strikes have affected uh, the way the Yemenis perceive the U.S. on the ground. This is part and parcel of why the Houthis took power in Yemen in the first place. This is an element uh, of anti-U.S. fervor, which was actually manufactured by the U.S. and perpetuated by Obama's foreign policy towards Yemen. The the fact that the U.S. has pursued such a, such a policy has made the Houthi rebels more, more liked and more favored within Yemen. So any intervention Obama takes in Yemen would actually be contradictory to his initial foreign policy within Yemen. However, the most likely um, result of all of this is further intervention in Yemen, more strikes on al-Qaeda, which is central to Obama's foreign policy. And we will see more, of a, more, of, more coordination between the Gulf Corporation uh, Council and the United States in regards to Yemen, especially in regards to the fact that al-Qaeda and ISIS now in Yemen are very, very significant and emerging highly within the Sunni population. Danny Monkey, Middle Eastern researcher with us in the now from London. Thanks so much. This morning, 150 people killed in an air crash in the French Alps. Specialists have managed to recover data from the black box of the crashed Airbus and add it will be useful. That's despite the recorders being severely damaged. These are the scenes, the latest scenes from the crash site. The mountain there covered with small fragments of the plane. Now the leaders of Spain, Germany and France have visited the crash site of the Airbus A320 to pay respects to the victims. And these are pictures from Germany. A high school there is mourning 16 students who were on board that plane. They were flying home with their two teachers from a week-long exchange program in Spain. The students were ages 15 to 16. The flight operated by German wings was heading from Spain's Barcelona to Dusseldorf. At around 10 a.m. local time, the A320 Airbus took off after a short delay. 45 minutes later, it started rapidly descending over the French Alps. The plane fell over 10,000 meters in about eight minutes. The pilots did not issue a distress call. There was zero indication the tragedy could have taken place in the very heart of Europe, where safety is top priority. Airbus A320 is one of the world's safest passenger jets. German Wings, parent company Lufthansa, is the 12th safest airline in the world. The last time it had a fatal accident was in 1993. Two people were killed then. The captain of this crash plane had 10 years flying experience.
Joining me in the now from Munich is former Lufthansa pilot Peter Heisenko. Thank you for being with us. What do you know about safety procedures at Lufthansa and German wings, and how thorough were the aircraft checks before takeoff? Well, uh, I would say everything was in good condition as normal. German wings, of course, is a low coster. Does that make any difference in terms of safety procedures? Uh, definitely not. Uh, everything in the Lufthansa company is, uh, well, they have the best uh, safety procedures possible. And it's the same training like Lufthansa pilots. So there is concerning safety, no difference between Lufthansa and uh, the Lufthansa owned companies. So what does it mean when we see a crash like this happen uh, in a part of the world where the record is stunning, really? Well, uh, I would say there must have happened something absolutely unusual to this aircraft, uh, something that nobody could have foreseen uh, before. The plane was descending for eight minutes. Uh, do you think that the pilots could have contacted air traffic controllers and sent some kind of signal? Well, I don't know how the actual technical condition of the aircraft was. But uh, I don't uh, see any reason why they shouldn't have been able to contact uh, somebody. But uh, these uh, pilots were definitely in, high, in a high level of distress, and they had other priorities than talking to anybody. The first priority is to save the aircraft, and, well, they didn't uh, succeed on that. Have you ever piloted an A320? Uh, no, but an A340. For the last couple of years, Lufthansa has been facing numerous strikes and walkouts by pilots, other personnel, dozens of flights being canceled. This couldn't have played a role, could it? Definitely not. This does not concern safety. This is uh, an internal uh, hassle about uh, payment and uh, other conditions. It doesn't have anything to do with flight safety. What kind of uh, scenarios are we going to see officials looking into and what will they rule out right away? Well, the last uh, messages concerning uh, this accident are quite uh, encouraging because now the official statement is that they do not exclude any possible cause. That certainly widens the ground. What should the company brace for after one of these planes crashed right in the middle of Europe? What kind of backlash are we going to see? Well, of course, uh, we see the, uh, the stock market reacted and so on. But uh, at the present time, there is no possibility to uh, make a real reaction to this accident because the cause of the accident is until now completely unclear. Peter Heisenko, former Lufthansa pilot, with us in the now from Munich. Thanks so much. Thank you. Coming up, Serbia marks 16 years since NATO's relentless bombing of Yugoslavia. Stay in the now. I'm not talking the language of war, but I will only react to situations. I have read the reports, but uh, I'm not in a position to... Uh... No, I will leave that to the State Department to comment on your latter point. I don't want to say that, yeah. And Mr. Kerry, do you have any comments on the document? Uh, no. no comment? Yeah, yeah, no Thank you. No more weasel words. When you evade a direct question, be prepared for a chase. When you throw a punch, be ready for a battle. Freedom of speech means little without the freedom to question. Do we speak your language? Want news, programs and documentaries in Spanish? What matters to you? Breaking news, alternative angles, hidden stories. Are you here? Then try RT Spanish. To find out more, visit actualidad.rt.com. Canadian students hit the streets to protest government budget cuts. Riot squads answered quick. Tear gas and police batons.
This week marks 16 years since NATO's three-month bombing campaign against Yugoslavia. Protests met the event in Serbia. NATO should be held accountable for the massive damage left behind, and some Serbs want the alliance to pay up. Non-governmental organizations have said NATO should be required to pay compensation for the devastating destruction inflicted during the 1999 attack. Serbian experts put the price tag at anywhere between 60 to 100 billion dollars. The bombing took place, of course, without any go-ahead from the United Nations, which is a violation of international law and norms. Joining us in the now is John Bosnich, Serbian journalist and political consultant. Thank you for being with us, John, from Belgrade today. Is it likely NATO will have to pay for the bombing it carried out 16 years ago against Belgrade? The answer to that question is entirely up to the Serbian people. If the Serbian people insist upon being repaid for the damage caused to their country, then they will get that payment. The problem is that the uh, preceding elections brought to power a government that pretended to be patriotic, that pretended to be anti-NATO, and then promptly signed every deal put in front of them by the NATO authorities. So I think the Serbian people will not fall for it again, and we've got a very um, lucky coincidence of events these past few years. We've got the anniversary of the end of World War II. We've got the 100th anniversary of World War I, in which Serbia's defense was, um, was unheard of, fighting off the most powerful empire in the world. And we, of course, have the anniversary of the illegal NATO bombing. And I think this is having an effect on the psyche of the Serbian people. What would compensation change, though, John? Oh, I mean, <laughs> We, we have a country here which has been so devastated by sanctions, bombing, corruption, NATO organized privatizations that if any of these figures that have been discussed for compensation were to be paid over to Serbia, it would, like, it would be like a complete rebirth of the economy. And not just the rebirth of the economy, the public sentiment would be rebuilt completely. Because what's been going on here is more than two decades of destructive sanctions and pressure on the country. So if some kind of compensation were possible, it would change the picture from black to white in a single day. You say that the government is pro-NATO. We certainly are seeing sentiments in the streets. We saw flags being burnt on, on Tuesday. How strong is this sentiment among the wider Serbian population? There has never been a majority of the population of Serbia in favor of NATO at any time. And the number who even consider it as a possibility is actually declining as we go forward. So if this were up to the Serbian people, 
it would never even be a possibility of joining NATO. But the government is operating in secret. There is no discussion of a referendum, which is what the people will have to demand. And if it goes to a referendum, there is zero chance of joining NATO, zero. There's a big difference, though, between being anti-NATO and burning NATO and American flags in the streets, though. Of course. You know, you need a catalyst to mobilize people, and the main catalyst is the return alive and well of Dr. Vojislav Šešel, the leader of the Radical Party, which is consistently been the strongest opposition party to NATO occupation, to the seizure of Kosovo, to the destruction of the Serbian economy, and to the basic submission of Serbian government to foreign control. Dr. Šešel went to The Hague voluntarily more than a decade ago. He fought The Hague, he beat The Hague, and he came back here a free man. And uh, I might add that had there not been the mysterious and still unexplained death of President Milosevic, he also would have come out of The Hague unscathed, not convicted. And, uh, and I can tell you that uh, just the arrival of Dr. Šešel alone has changed the mentality of the people here in Serbia. Serbian government is looking towards NATO, but not alone. They're also looking toward the EU. Tell us the sentiment on the ground in Belgrade about the prospects of joining that union. Look, uh, we, we should call a spade a spade. The EU is a U.S.-dominated contraption to bring uh, European economies under U.S. control. NATO is a U.S.-dominated contraption de designed to bring all non-Russian, non-Chinese militaries in the world under their control. So both of these are two sides of the same coin, and that is the American imperial coin. And uh, this coin flips. One day you see the EU side, which is the bribery side. Oh, you're going to have money, you're going to have jobs, you're going to have investment. And the next day you see the, the darker side, which is NATO. And in fact, um, the reason why NATO is so focused on getting Serbia inside its ranks is because it's transparently clear that NATO wants the Serbian people to play the role of Taras Bulba's son, if you know this literature, the Cossack leader's son who led the enemy forces into his father's camp. And that is NATO's dream scenario, that the Serbs will join NATO and that the Serbs will betray their ethnic roots and their ethnic brotherhood with Russia and lead NATO troops to Moscow. And I can tell you, that is never going to happen. That is some kind of a <laughs> panacolor Hollywood dream scenario, which can never happen. The Serbian people will never do it. And neither will the Serbian people join the EU because the EU itself is collapsing. And there is nothing in the EU except a one-way ticket out for anybody who can get a job in Strasbourg, in Paris, in London. And the relegation of the rest of this country to a un an underpaid economic colony. And every day, more and more Serbs are, are becoming aware of this fact. John Bosnich, Serbian journalist and political consultant with us in the now from Belgrade. Thanks so much. Thank you. Monsanto's weed killer is causing cancer, according to the World Health Organization. Glyphosate, which is produced by the world's top GM giant under the brand of Roundup, is the leading herbicide used in the U.S. It ends up in Monsanto's seeds, even those which, according to the company, are poison tolerant. The ingredient was also found in air and rain samples, as well as in tap water. Well, the company denies the allegations and seeks immediate retraction while boosting the invasion of GM products in supermarkets across the globe. Here's Marina Portnoy. America is getting a new line of biotech fruits and vegetables containing the qualities most humans want in definite youth and perfect aesthetics. Now, the regular apples we're accustomed to eventually turn brown after being sliced open or when rotting. But the Arctic apples approved by the FDA have been genetically engineered to stay crisp and resist any kind of discoloration. So the fruit of temptation will look flawless for hours or even days after 
after being sliced open. Meanwhile, the GMO innate potatoes approved by the U.S. government will be altered to resist bruising. When fried, they will reportedly produce less of a potential carcinogen. Now, advocates say keeping the produce flawless will cut food waste and make the apples and potatoes more appealing. But amid growing backlash and public concerns surrounding GMO foods, some experts believe consumers may abandon apples and potatoes altogether. It will create greater confusion among consumers as to which foods contain uh, genetically modified manipulation, which, which foods are GMO and which ones are non-GMO. If I want to stay away from genetically modified foods, um, maybe I'll just stay away from apples in general. And this may have a real ripple effect for apple farmers and potato farmers because consumers will not be able to differentiate between GMO apples and non-GMO apples. The U.S. government claims that genetic Arctic apples and innate potatoes are as safe as their conventional counterparts, but there's reason for the public to be skeptical. In 2013, the U.S. assured the public that the widely used weed killer known as Roundup is safe to use without unreasonable risk to people or the environment. Yet last week, a branch of the World Health Organization released a study indicating that an active ingredient in Roundup can probably cause cancer. Monsanto, the world's largest producer of GMO seeds and Roundup, dismissed the WHO study as inaccurate and dramatic. Marina Portnaya, RT, New York. A university in the U.S. has come up with a motivational catalog. It shouts success. The motto is, why follow when you can win? And look who wins. Two white men in suits while a black man and a woman are left behind. Now, as a woman, I find it a little bit offensive. And it's not just me. Twitter users have come out. They're commenting on the picture, some saying it's a perfect metaphor of how race and gender play out in corporate America. White men beating a woman and a black man. That's a hashtag. And one user dubbed the college catalog tone deaf. No wonder the brochure was eventually removed from its website. Thank you for being in the now. Stay in touch with us online. You can find all our best clips on YouTube and more all fair in the now exclusives on Vine, Facebook and Twitter. See you tomorrow. Till then, it's now or never.